Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of the region. In partnership with Common Frontiers, Council on Hemispheric Affairs, Friends of Latin America, Interreligious Task Force on Central America, Massachusetts Peace Action, and Task Force on the Americas, we broadcast weekly at 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink's YouTube channel. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Telegram, and at radindymedia.com. Today's episode is Brazil's presidential election goes to a second round. I'm really pleased um, to have two guests join us today. Both were on the ground in Brazil on Election Day, October 2nd. Uh, joining us from Brazil today is Camila Escalante of Casa Chu News. And joining us from the US, just returning from Brazil, is Craig Jardula of the Convo Couch. I'd like to give uh, the audience just a brief background before we start our conversation. Uh, so here we go. Brazil's presidential election is headed for a runoff vote, electoral authorities said on Sunday, October 2nd, after President Jair Bolsonaro's surprising strength in the first round spoiled uh, Lula Inacio uh, da Silva's hopes for winning outright. With 99.7% of the electronic votes counted, Lula was ahead with 48.4% of the votes uh, versus 43.3% for Bolsonaro. The National Electoral Authority reported this on Monday. As neither got a major uh, support or majority of the support, the race will go to a second round on October 30th. Several opinion surveys had shown Lula, who was president from 2003 to 2010, leading the far right Bolsonaro by 10 to 15 percentage points ahead of the October 2nd vote. The much tighter result dashed hopes for a quick resolution in a deeply polarized election. So welcome both of you and let's talk about this, this deeply polarized election, which came down to neither candidate achieving greater than 50% and basically 48 to 43%, much closer, I think, than any of the three of us had imagined going into Sunday, October 2nd. Both of you were there. I'm sorry, I was not able to join you <laughs> and um, was really looking forward to um, sharing the, the observation and experience on the second with all of you, but I'm really happy both of you are here today with us. And so where should we start? Should we maybe have a little bit of background uh, of what the uh, context of Brazil looked like prior to October 2nd? And then a discussion on, on how things actually unfolded on the 2nd? Maybe Cam Camilla, you could give us a, a quick background as to the lead up to October 2nd? Yeah, absolutely. Well. You know, I think a good place to start is in 2016, we witnessed the coup against Dilma Rousseff. And that was a, you know, very important point because people see it here as, you know, the first coup against the Brazilian people, um, you know, followed by that, we saw Michelle Temer um, absolutely slaughter, uh, you know, the Brazilian state that continued under Jair Bolsonaro, which was the second coup against the Brazilian people um, in which, Former President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva was, um, he was jailed and to prevent him from running in the 2018 election. He was already a pre-candidate for the Workers' Party. And, you know, that was a formal thing. So this truly is a case of, you know, the oligarchy and the far right um, and numerous individuals within different institutions, you know, getting together and barring their political opponent from running for president at a time when he was polling as the most uh, popular potential candidate to run in 2018 as president. All polls said that Lula da Silva would actually win if he were to face off against Jair Bolsonaro or anyone else in that race. Uh, so he landed himself or he was taken to prison, a federal prison in Curitiba for three, 580 days during which you know, the workers party had to uh, they had to decide on another candidate. It was Fernando Haddad, uh, who today is a, uh, a candidate for governor of the state of Sao Paulo, and someone who's just, you know, really just not as popular. Lula left office uh, during his two previous mandates 
as the most popular president, um, according to surveys in the history of Brazil, the highest approval. So, you know, people were prepared to bring him back to the presidency when, uh, when Dilma Rousseff was couped. And so, uh, you know, there were a lot of slogans that came out around that time, 2016, which were like, you know, Brazil, urgent, Lula is Brazil, urgente, Lula presidente. Those sorts of chants that were you know, saying me to bring Lula back to power um, for, you know, numerous reasons, but, you know, his kind of flagship policies were poverty alleviation and, uh, you know, kind of bolstering the state industries uh, um, and institutions in order to work for the benefit of the Brazilian people. It's something that we've seen work very successfully in Bolivia and something we've tried to highlight as Calcetra News, but what a lot of people don't know is a lot of those same types of policies were applied here in Brazil under Lula's government. And Lula had a very uh, good relationship with Hugo Chavez, Cristina Kitchener, and all the other uh, you know, pink tide leaders of our continent in the early 2000s. And so, you know, that's the sort of thing that people wanted to see back. They have been saying, you know, uh, during this campaign period, which launched on August 16th, officially, that they want to see their refrigerators full once again. They want to be able to dress the way they used to dress and have nicer clothes. They want to be able to afford gas, be able to vacation. They want leisure time. People want decent salaries and with that dignity. And they say, you know, people are juggling like three, four gigs, uh, you know, precarious type of work, uh, not very strong salaries. Um, and, you know, th there's this uberization of the economy that people have been talking about a lot where young people, particularly young men, find themselves working as delivery food drivers. That's literally what a whole bunch of people do in this country. And so people understand that it's not accept an acceptable uh, structure for an economy and there's not a whole lot of opportunity for young people. So, you know, there's two... Uh, different uh, candidates here. We also had, you know, some third party candidates that have played a role as well. Uh, but, you know, the two were Luis Ignacio Lula da Silva, who represented, you know, bringing back those policies that tried and true, that, you know, worked for the benefit of the people. And the, the failed policies, specifically economic policies of Jair Bolsonaro, um, who has um, in the polls gained a lot of resentment. There's a lot of people who have said in the polls that they would never in any circumstance vote for, for Bolsonaro. And that's, those are, that's what's you know, indicating to us that going now into the second round, um, as you kind of said, uh, Bolsonaro actually won a greater share of the vote than anyone had predicted. Lula, uh, received about, you know, about what the, the main pollsters, IPEC and Datafolia said he was going to receive. Uh, but it was a little bit of a surprise that Bolsonaro seems to have uh, picked up some of the support that uh, Ciro Gomez, a third, uh, a third place, what was supposed to be third place in the polls, but actually he came in fourth uh, to a woman uh, named Tebet. And it seemed like Ciro Gomez's points went over to uh, went over to Bolsonaro when a lot of people on the left and analysts of the Workers' Party had already suspected that they were that that Ciro Gomez was in some way supporting Bolsonaro by trying to frame himself as left alternative. So um, that being said, I, I'm just trying to summarize here because I know we don't have a super long show. But uh, we saw that result on Sunday. On Monday morning, the PT uh, campaign coordination hold, held a meeting and they talked about how they're already, they've had already spoken to numerous uh, parties and candidates and figures to try to receive, to get their endorsement for the second round that's going to take place at the end of the month. Um, and then in the last two days, we've heard that some of those endorsements have been secured. That includes the party of Ciro Gomez and uh, Tebet, the woman who came in uh, third place, which is about four or five percent of the vote. And, you know, Lula and his campaign are, re you know, strategizing right now. Bolsonaro is doing just the same. They're looking at that big ab abstention, the people who didn't vote and going to go after them, the people who are undecided for the second round. 
and numerous groups such as evangelical and other Christian groups um, and other people that they would like to target because it's you know, going to become very strategic at this point to try to get every last vote. And we're going to see a lot of fake news and a lot of rumors and a lot of attacks uh, between, you know, the Bolsonaristas and the, you know, the sort of pro-PT or pro-Lula um, sectors. And we're seeing that unfold on social media right now. Um, you know, a, a lot of interesting things calling both Bolsonaro and Lula Satanists, um, saying that Bolsonaro is a Freemason, among other things. So that's kind of what's happening right now. Lula is kind of back on the campaign trail at the same time. Today, he held um, a big rally in San Bernardo de Campo, which is his hometown with the uh, ABC metal workers. Um, it's really important. And, you know, it just goes back to what, what Lula even stands for and what he comes from, which is the trade union movement, that he is one of the greatest uh, trade union leaders, labor leaders of our time alive right now in the Americas. That's his background, and that's actually the background and the foundation of the Workers' Party. It's not about, you know, all sorts of random things. I don't know. A lot of people in the U.S. have tried to compare the Workers' Party to, for example, the Democrats in the U.S. That absolutely doesn't make any sense whatsoever. When you look at, uh, you know, a lot of the, the candidates for the Workers' Party come from uh, a union background or student union background. They come from labor, and Lula was a very important figure of that in the last few decades. And so that's where he started. He's sort of starting his campaign for the next four weeks is there with, with the labor. So Camilla, there's one thing uh, interesting to me that you, that kind of leaped out that you said, you know, that people are voting for uh, a return to the economic policies they had when Lula was president, 2003 to 2010, food in their refrigerators, uh, access to better paying jobs to afford you know, more of their necessities. This is one of the things that has continually come up throughout all of these elections. And I would share with the audience that the three of us uh, speaking today have served as election observers, either as international observers, journalists, and our work has overlapped many, many times across the Americas. I'm really honored to say that and that I have gotten to know the two of you uh, much better over the course of the last year and a half. But one of the things I think we could all three agree on as we've watched elections unfold from Bolivia in November of 2020, all the way through uh, this past um, Sunday, October 2nd, people are voting for national sovereignty, natural resource sovereignty, and governments that are proposing an economic plan that benefits the majority of the citizens. And those economic plans range from anywhere from one step left of center being more social democratic all the way to revolutionary leftist economic plans and it's 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 a consistent theme i i feel and um and it will be really really fascinating to see um how these campaigns unfold between now and the 30th of october it seems to me what Brazil, to me, but how they're going to vote ultimately. But that's a, that's me hoping, you know, as a white person in the north, not a Brazilian. So, Craig, mm -hmm. you have you were on the ground October second. You your work specifically focuses on um, electoral observation and specifically the technicalities and the procedures that other countries um, constitutions. Um, and shrine, and often contradictory to what we believe is democratic voting in the United States. So let's talk about what you saw on yeah. on October second. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, <clears throat> me and Fiorella put this on the map quite some time ago. Um, obviously, you know, I, I get educated from you, ladies, on what goes down in the global South, and it's always a, a pleasure to follow <laughs> your work and get such an understanding. Uh, I did predict that uh, Bolsonaro would make it to the second round. Uh, you know, I couldn't put my finger on it before I went. And, you know, I have a theory on why maybe he did get to the second round. But a lot of the reasons that we're told in the states, the conservatives, why they go Bolsonaro crazy. I really didn't have it. I don't think it had any effect on what the actual decision making was going on from the Brazilians down in uh, Brazil. Uh, and, and that was evident when I went there. The things that are important to the people in the West aren't necessarily important to the people of Brazil. And I, you can see it clearly. There was so much homelessness. 
people digging in trash cans, you know, and uh, um, people saying that they used to have bread and eggs and milk in their refrigerator. Now they ain't got nothing. Uh, and it was evident to see that. In fact, that of all the last six countries I went to, I saw more homelessness and poor there. And, you know, Lula, uh, from what I know, you know, from being a, a Westerner, was always a champion of the poor. He'd always, you know, speak about how we can get food and resources into those people's hands. And when I visited the favelas, that's what they had mentioned, that before in the past, Lula was a champion of the poor. Their kids didn't have to share an egg or eat crackers for dinner back in the days. And when Bolsonaro became, you know, president, that had all gone away and all that money had been directed into other areas. Also, you know, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm still learning a lot about Brazil, but I understand my country and my uh, uh, the, I don't want to say the necessary that the intelligence communities and what goes on and their involvement in jailing Lula. It was, you know, we had gotten the proof right there. So I understood there was an involvement from the United States. Going to Brazil, it was the same as far as what people are voting for, not only just for national sovereignty, but resource sovereignty, because a lot of the resources in Brazil are shipped out of the country. You know, there's like six or seven multinational corporations that are now taking all these resources and they're being shipped away while the small farmers being driven off their land and big agriculture has taken control of the situation. So, you know, we concentrate on the process, making sure no matter what that Brazilians decide that Brazilians choose. Thank you for setting me straight. I am a boomer. Uh, and looking through this process was very interesting because it was very different than a lot of the other processes we saw in Nicaragua, <laughs> Honduras, Peru, Colombia, for that matter, where they don't have a hand-marked paper trail. However, they have a DRE system, which I would never, ever stand behind. I would never endorse a direct recorded electronic system is what Brazil has, but their system is open source. So in other words, all the candidates, all the parties, they have a right to look at the software. Um, the machines are not connected to the internet. I went into a polling place when it opened and I went from room to room and I had my internet on to see if any of the machines would, would catch an internet service like we was easy to catch in the United States. None of the machines were connected to the internet. They weren't plugged into the internet whatsoever. Each machine printed out a tally showing you that it had zero tally, zero votes on it. At the very end, I went back to the same polling place and it had the actual mark results in which they post on the door. So even though Bolsonaro has made this claim, and it's a claim he made to the system that is the same system he won under. It's very different than when Donald Trump, when he has his complaints, Donald Trump complained because the system was turned upside down. They added drop boxes, mass mail outs, uh, this and this and that. Bolsonaro had won under the system. It was the same system he won on. So for him to complain about it now seemed a little bit hypocritical. Uh, and like I said, it is an open source system. And, and, and it's a transparent process, process as, as where, is, where the vote is cast, it is also counted. It's not taken off to another location and counted. And that's something really, really important. So we were able to see this system in play. Uh, like I said, you can't 100% trust a DRE system, but it seems like they had all their checks and balances. And when a lot of Brazilians have faith in the system and I have faith in the system, I would take this system over the United States system any day of the week. So the process itself seems fair. Uh, Bolsonaro won under that system, so it's hard to see him have a gripe on it. But I did... Going back to the electoral system itself, I did say that Bolsonaro would make it to the second round for reasons I don't think played a part. So that's what I'm curious to try to figure out, because I do feel going back to when uh, when jail Lula had an interview with Glenn Greenwald, something he said stuck with me. And I kind of saw that evident when I went to Brazil. He said that, you know, Glenn people at the airport would see these indigenous people, these poor people for the first time getting a chance to get on a plane and fly. And they get to experience stuff they never got to experience again. And you can see the working class kind of look at them in the middle class, look at them with disdain. And I don't know if that played a part to why a lot of people voted for Bolsonaro, but I did find it very funny that every single Uber driver I talked to, every cab driver I talked to, the majority of them were for Bolsonaro. Now, here are these guys are working in a gig economy, probably driving that car all day just to get some food on the table. But yet they would buy into the marketing. And I don't know if it was confirmation bias or they really believed the marketing that Julia, Lula was a criminal because we'd say, you know, Lula was acquitted on all counts. Oh, no, no, no. He's a criminal, blah, blah, blah. But I don't know if it's a disdain between the working class and the peasants and the poor people. But Bolsonaro did get a lot of votes. And I'm still trying to analyze that and still try to figure it out right now because there was 55 million votes so that's a lot of the population 
And I did predict he make he would make it to the second round. I thought it was a win for him that day that Lula didn't wrap it up. I still think Lula's going to win, but uh, these are some interesting things to analyze and some interesting things to look at moving forward to the last uh, till October thirtieth and to get that second round. This is interesting to me, what your comment about uh, working class versus poor. Mm -hmm. So poor, the, so perhaps, Camilla, the poor people ha is a demographic that needs to be pursued more by the working class. I'm not sure what I'm hearing. Is that, is it, because I know we have seen in other countries as people move out of poverty into working class, into middle class, they tend to forget where they come from. That is not country specific. That's not culturally, culturally specific. It seems to be what we human beings do once we move out of poverty, get into working class, get into middle class, you tend to forget where you came from. And that's not a, that's just a personal observation of my own. That's not a judgment against any particular country, political system or culture. Um, but what, what is that? Is that, is that, did that true? No, I think it's, I think it's, or, I don't, I don't know if that's like the, how I would frame it. I think it's better analyzed as, you know, regionally there are certain, you know, certain strongholds. It depends on where people are, you know, where the people are based around the country. Then within like the state or even the city, it depends on where they're located there. Um, it's not only about, you know, what their income level is, but also like if they live in a rural area, a semi-rural area, the periphery, or the sort of, you know, the, the urban center of a city. And, you know, these are all different factors that weigh on the sort of, you know, the tendency for people to vote. And also, you know, Bolsonaro has done quite a job of, you know, luring in certain people who are perhaps less likely to pay attention to the facts of his economic mismanagement by some of his rhetoric. I mean, there's hate speech, there's um, you know racism and other forms of bigotry there that he really plays on because he knows that you know there are several um, areas of the country. Sao Paulo is one of them where there is like a little bit of you know some currents of um, right wing extremism. Um, in the state of Paraná and, uh, you know, to the south of us, even uh, the state of Mato Grosso do Sul, uh, where the capital is Porto Alegre there, where there are neo-Nazi groups and there are a lot of people who support, uh, you know, Ukraine and NATO. And so, you know, these are the sorts of things that, you know, they're not necessarily voting based on their own class interests. They could be people who are from lower class background and make very little income but they're actually being you know appealed to in a, in a very you know strategic campaign or at least it's deliberate uh you know to play up on these things like islamophobia the speech that's anti-communist they say things you know against venezuela this is what you know brazil is going to look like brazil's going to turn into argentina um you know with the hyperinflation that argentina is experiencing right now we hear a lot of that on talk radio on the big networks where they have right-wing analysts, they're really fear-mongering and they believe that, you know, they, they believe that, that information, uh, you know, those tall tales about the workers' party leaders being corrupt, specifically yeah. Lula and Dilma, but they're also, you know, but they're also being brought in by a whole lot of other things. And one of those things is COVID. You know, the Bolsonaro took advantage of the fact that you know the whole this whole conversation was going on in the U.S. about COVID, um, about vaccines or not, lockdowns or not, and things like that. And he he really used that to his advantage at the time when a lot of the people, even within the Workers Party, that is a you know a party of the masses, it does have its own bureaucracy with a lot of people who come from the city, some of which are middle class, and so you know they might be thinking right now about the fact that they need to strategize about how from the campaign they need to be speaking to more regular working class Brazilians and not you know continue to allow themselves to be portrayed as any sort of elitist because even in Latin America a lot of left-wing parties 
are, you know, are kind of uh, portrayed as elitist as a strategy by the right to try to say that Bolsonaro is like a regular dude. He understands regular Brazilians and things like that. When it's, you know, absolutely, there's no basis to that. Actually, Bolsonaro's family owns over a hundred properties, his immediate family, not his extended family. And they're all paid in cash, which is, you know, signifies that it could be, you know, part of some sort of, uh, you know, mafia stuff. I mean, quite frankly, there's a lot of illegal activity going on there, as well as the people around him who own la large areas of land. So, you know, there's nothing relatable between Bolsonaro and his family and the people around him and the people who support him and regular working class Brazilians, but they want to put out that image and, and people, a lot of people are buying into it. A lot of people are saying that they don't even really like Bolsonaro because they can see and feel that the economy has tanked, but they say the only thing we can do at this point to stop communism and to stop Brazil from becoming Venezuela, as they like to say, is for us to, to give our vote to Bolsonaro, even though we don't wholeheartedly support him. So there's a range of reasons why, why he's getting that support. And this is something that currently the, the PT has to sit down and this alliance of parties, which is about 10 parties who are supporting Lula, uh, formally giving their endorsement in this election, including some major parties like the PASOL, the Pesado Bay, and the Perdido Verde, they're all having to think about how to speak to the people um, and not let, a, you know, not let um, Bolsonaro to kind of have that, you know, that communication with people and, and misconstrue who he actually is, which is not a regular person, not someone that anyone in Brazil can really identify with. <laughs> is that trick is used all the time, right? Like, oh, you just sit down and have a beer with George W. Bush. He's I a was regular just gonna guy. say that. <laughs> <laughs> that Donald was the Trump Bush 2 campaign. Guy. Yeah. The Bush 2 campaign was that. Yeah. He's a that, exactly. So what do we see? What 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 are the two of you see? Camilla, you've been great at explaining the coalition building and the and the messaging that has to come out of the Lula campaign between now and the 30th, what should we, is there anything else we should be looking for between now and the 30th of October? And I guess top of mind would be uh, OAS and or uh, the US NATO, um, what came from the Secretary of State earlier this week uh, about Russia in the Americas. Is that going, are either one or both of those issues going to affect uh, the campaigning between now and October? Well, I think that on Lula's part um, and from, you know, from the campaign's uh, standpoint, they have tried uh, to the extent possible to kind of stay away from some big issues that could be divisive or overly political, quite frankly, they don't want to say too much. It's safer just to go with, you know, with reiterating how successful Lula's economic program was previously. And a lot of people from, you know, who do work for, for example, Petrobras, or in different factories, who are members of unions, and where the unions overwhelmingly, you know, support Lula and the Workers' Party, they say that the only way to strengthen the economy is to invest in national industries, national industries and say companies that were closed down uh, in, since 2016 by the two successive neoliberal governments, first the coup one and then the second coup one, which was Bolsonaro. And that the only way that, um, you know, the entire uh, country can uh, recover and prosper is to have those, those strong industries. And so, these are the sorts of things that Lula has been uh, promising. And he, he's going back to talking about, you know, the welfare subsidies and different programs that benefit uh, women and families. And that's their focus. I think that they're, you know, really, sh they have said in terms of internationally that they do want to have, be respected by Russia, China and the EU and the US and also have a good relationship with all of the neighbors that includes Venezuela. And, uh, those sorts of things, but he hasn't gone into great detail and, you know, for good reason. I mean, he is, he is popular for his domestic policies. And so that has to be his focus. However, now, uh, you know, he does have to 
they do need to spend a little bit more time focusing on these different sectors. Unfortunately, it is going to, you know, just turn a whole lot of time over to this massive uh, population of evangelical Christians and to try to take some of those votes away uh, from Bolsonaro. And um, yeah, I, I, it's one thing that uh, I, I haven't confirmed this, but, you know, Bolsonaro, I think has like uh, part, made a purchase of, of gas from Russia recently, yeah. just before the vote, he, um, you know, lowered the price of certain uh, essential goods from the grocery store and things like that. Also that people can feel temporarily relieved uh, from the financial hardships so many families are facing so that they'll think that the situation is not bad as it is, but I don't think that's going to work. And I don't think there's enough time in the next now three and a half weeks for Bolsonaro to just start, you know, giving out handouts uh, just to flip these votes. I think it's, I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve. Whereas there's this whole like machinery behind Lula very much. It's a, it's a very, sophisticated operation with lots of lawyers and advisors and he has received very important endorsements from essentially centrist center right even uh parties and and candidates and uh and sectors of the of the country's oligarchy and all sorts of figures that you wouldn't expect uh to have seen support lula before have come on board so i think it's you know I think I think it's a, a, a huge uphill climb for for Bolsonaro at this point. And of course, the polls had said that he would have a much tougher time in the second round. Yeah. So, Craig, you uh, you and I were talking before we went live about what's the technicalities, the, the actual physical process of voting. Mm -hmm. uh, in Brazil versus the United States. And Camilla, you were mentioning Bolsonaro buying, you know, cheap Russian gas and getting gas prices down and, and creating the illusion that the economy is benefiting the majority of Brazilian citizens in the run up to the election. I would argue we are seeing exactly the same thing unfold in the United States mm -hmm. being led by, by the Biden administration. And let's, Craig, can you just give us a quick comparison of what you saw in Brazil versus what <clears throat> is playing out today in the United States with U.S. midterm elections coming up in November, because I think that's a really a, a big part of your work is being able to observe and critique foreign elections, but also bring that knowledge back to you know a valuable critique Absolutely. Of, of our own elections in the states. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of, you know, Bolsonaro people who, you know, all, all we were talking about some endorsements, you know, uh, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro also got the endorsement of Steve Bannon and crew. And that's like really strong. Like he talks about that on a regular basis. But, you know, it's like when I when I was in Colombia, I said, guys, you know, you're in this runoff now. You're going here for the presidency. You have your your, your second round coming up. You can have a Petro supporter at every single Mesa out there that can re rep report the results to eliminate a process of che cheating as they move these votes along. The Bolsonaro people can do the same thing. They have no excuses here. They can't sit there and blame the system, especially a system they won under. So they can do that themselves. So I would say, well, then tell Bolsonaro to get his people out there, have him at every single voting room and look at the votes. And therefore, you guys can get your own tally before it even gets moved off to the next spot. But I do also want to point out really quickly, aside from that, that coming out of BRICS, Bolsonaro did make a deal for diesel gas when it with Lula, uh, not excuse me, with uh, Putin uh, coming out of bricks to get lower gas prices and whatnot. I think in a gig economy, right, when you have a bigger gig, gig economy, and there's a huge gig economy in uh, Sao Paulo when I was there, everybody, so many Uber drivers, everybody's running around delivering food, whatnot. I, I think that if, and maybe I'm wrong, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but if Lula can, can, can somehow address that, people working in a gig economy, you know what I'm saying? And somehow he can find some relief for those people as far as when they file their taxes or whatnot, or find a way to concentrate on those people, maybe pick off some votes there for people who are looking at that economic uh, situations. Maybe he can find some more votes over there as well. I don't know why so many Uber drivers were so supportive and believed in the marketing of Lula being a criminal despite him being acquitted. But it seems like an area that's ripe for the picking right there because they do look at the gas prices and they're like, oh, look at that. Gas prices are coming down. 
So maybe that could be an area that Lula can concentrate when it comes to the economics as the people working in that gig economy and find some votes right over there as well. Camilla, did you want to add something? <laughs> Yeah, he has included that in his campaign he has. Uh, speeches. He has said that he would improve, um, you know, living standards for the Brazilian people generally, but also ensure the rights of, you know, app and gig workers. And I think that, you know, there's a large, there's a large section of the population here who don't, haven't normalized that. They don't think it's normal for so many young people, young men to be driving pizzas around for rich people for a living. And um, so, so I do think that that is something that he would address, but he would not address it, you know, not only specifically to try to maybe um, implement some, you know, push some of a, uh, you know, structure for, for making sure that there are some, you know, better laws in place to govern over those sorts of jobs. But I think he would just, you know, get to the root of it, which is strengthening uh, you know, strengthening state companies and industries so that people will no longer even have to work those because a lot of the people who do work those sorts of jobs work other full-time jobs as well. And they're just having to work multiple jobs seven days a week. They have a weekend gig, they have a night gig. There's been so many of the, uh, you know, drivers that I've spoken to. And so it's really just clamping down on precarity in general um, and ensuring rights of workers overall. And that would uh, surely, you know, at some point help, help the, these sorts of gig workers as well. So the second round is October 30th. Where are the two of you going to be on o October 30th? October 29th, I'm going to actually oh. be at a convention in Orlando speaking about election integrity, so oh, I will not great. be able to, but I know they'll be all, they're going to be talking about it there. They were talking about it at the last uh, uh, event I went to, and I had to, you know, once again, I don't know a ton about it, but I know about 95% more than American people know about what's going on in Brazil, and I can explain to them what is going on and the importance of Lula and why he is so popular there and what he has done for the poor in the past and how Bolsonaro has not. So, I mean, um, now that I've gone there and I've seen the system as well, because they've Bolsonaro did complain that the system was rigged against him, even though he won in the system. And I can also point out and say, no, that's not true. Are we were able to witness the system. It's an open source system, and it is going to be a fair system. And I do think, honestly, that once Bolsonaro loses, I don't think he's going to try to stay and maintain power, regardless of what you hear what's going on with Bernie Sanders and everybody else in our Congress, just trying to people distract people with all this BS. I think you'll see Lula win, and I think you'll see Bolsonaro step away, maybe not gracefully, maybe crying like a little baby, but I think you'll see him step away. So Craig's calling for a, Craig's calling a Lula victory later this month. And Camilla, you're in uh, Brazil now, and you're going to stay there? No, I'll be leaving in a few days, and I'll be coming back. Okay, uh, great. I believe. And, you know, like, you know, our angle is Kevsatch in news. Uh, obviously, I'm also correspondent for Press TV and reporting on this for Press TV. But, you know, first and foremost, I'm the editor of Kevsatch in news. And what's important to us is really just highlighting, you know, the project of the social movements, because it is social movements that have been the most strong support base for the Workers' Party and for Lula's candidacy for so long. And they have a much larger project than just electing uh, this one person. What they want to do is get this person in power so that they can start pushing from below. And they have formed these, uh, you know, popular committees where people from different neighborhoods uh, or could be groups of artists or any sort of other agglomeration of people, uh, you know, meet together in person. It can even be online. And they're discussing some of the most important issues and issues that they want to push from the base to, uh, to the government. But you know, these movements are quite large in comparison to what we see in other countries. And they do have, you know, oftentimes in the case of the landless workers movement um, and some of the movements for housing against poverty, um, against evictions and to the, the right for food um, and things like that. Like they, they have a very um, strong, you know, ideological position. And they actually, in a lot of cases are to the left of Lula. And so they're going to have a lot of things that they're going to be fighting for. And so this is something we would like to highlight 
um, you know, between now and the election. We've done a lot of interviews while I've been here. Some of them, you know, weren't able to get published before the first round vote. So we're going to be publishing that um, in the coming weeks before the second round. But it's a really, uh, it's a very interesting um, phenomenon that's taking place here. I do think that Brazil is a model for the world. It doesn't have an anti-imperialist government now. And, you know, arguably it's not going to when, when uh, Lula comes to power, that he might not be the communist leader that we actually want. He's no Hugo Chavez. But, you know, it gives an opportunity for, um, you know, the movements that truly represent the interests of the people to begin to push from below. So that's what we're going to be covering. We do believe that, or I believe that Lula will win. And part of their strategy is, of course, using the, these very robust movements as their foot soldiers in the campaign. These go out every day. They flyer, they sticker at men stations, at bus stops, out in public plazas, squares, and they're speaking to people because they believe that we can't fight, um, you know, disinformation and anti-communist propaganda and win this election solely by creating memes on the internet. Although that's one strategy and that's, that's part of what they need to be doing is disseminating information on social media, but that they do need to be speaking face-to-face -face with working class people who make up the majority of the country and, you know, trying to trying to convince them that it's only with a Lula government that we're going to see the material conditions of the people improve. And they have their own strategies and methods for doing that. They're having to sit down this week and devise you know, a new plan for these final weeks. And I believe that is very interesting. And I think it will undoubtedly secure the win. Well, let's let's finish this or continue this conversation after the second round election. It'd be, it'd be fabulous to have you both back and um, and uh, hopefully celebrate a Lula win. And probably <laughs> you're both calling it, and I'm hoping for it. So let let's let's uh, continue the conversation um, after the second round, and um, and hopefully it'll be a celebration and deconstruct how how all of this um, comes about, and probably. Uh, and how it will affect the Americas as well, all of the Americas. So anyway, you two, thank you so much for joining us um, for this episode. It's always a pleasure to work with both of you. And um, I just want to remind our audience that you've been uh, listening to What the F is Going On in Latin America and the Caribbean, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news um, out of the region. We broadcast every week on Code Pink YouTube. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. And I also want to be sure uh, to let you know about Code Pink Radio, which broadcasts every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern on WBAI out of New York City and uh, WPFW out of Washington, D.C. That project can also be found on uh, Apple Podcasts and Spotify as well. So thank you again to Craig Jargula of the Convo Couch and Camilla Escalante of Costume News. And um, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much for having us, Terry. Thank you.